What I thought we'd do is just as kind of a warm up since for those of you who don't know me, I am a full-time faculty member at Penn State University. I've been teaching blended courses for eight years now. I've been doing online for three. I've been doing web enhanced for maybe five. I'm going to talk a lot about the different types of courses, but I'm going to talk more about why I'm convinced, I feel like I'm on a TED talk, um, why I'm convinced, that, <laughs> I know I flatter myself, um, why I'm convinced that technology, more than any point in educational history, has the potential to revolutionize the amount of learning that goes on in college. So, I think it's so neat that someone from Penn State did this. The ITS staff put this together. Um, I've been doing this, but it's, I've never called it. This is within the last six months I've heard this phrase, flipping the classroom. And it's really neat. So, what? course where you normally lecture to students during class time. They work on homework and group assignments during their own time. Whoops, hang on. Outside of class time. So you can Okay. What if there were a way to do the lectures outside of class time so you could use class time to have students work on activities together? Welcome to Flipping the Classroom, Simply Speaking. It's a pretty common course design. Students gather in a classroom a few times a week to hear a lecture. A faculty member may show slides, play a few videos, demonstrate some concepts, or solve problems. On their own time, students work on problems and arrange times to meet to work on group projects. Some faculty are finding ways to increase student engagement and improve learning by flipping this design. In the new model, students watch, listen to, and interact with content on their own time, and then use class time for engaging activities. Here's how it works. Say you're teaching a biology course. One week, you talk about invasive animal species, such as the Asian carp. Instead of lecturing, you post a few YouTube videos about Asian carp. You also produce a video of your own in which you show some photographs, of other invasive species and talk about their origins. You want to keep each video interesting, so you keep them under 10 minutes each. To help trigger discussion, you also include some questions that you'll be asking students to think and talk about during your next class session. Later in the semester, students can go back to these videos to review key concepts to prepare for an exam or to guide a project or paper. Short videos are just one option. Audio podcasts, voice thread, and many types of interactive media can be used as well. The main idea is to capture your presence, thoughts, and guidance that would normally take place in a classroom setting. Now that the lecture is done outside the classroom, what do your students do when they get together? You can have students bring their laptops to class, work in groups, and research one of the other invasive species that you discussed in your video. Where do they come from? What impact are they having? What is being done to control them? Since they're doing this research during class time, they can get your assistance in determining good sources of information and how to interpret what they're seeing. Also, you'll get a better idea of which students are doing their fair share of work in their groups. There won't be any more excuses that students don't have time to get together for group work. If an interesting idea comes from one group, you can get the attention of the class and have a spontaneous discussion. In short, you create a much more active environment. There are many other activities you can do in the classroom. Have students discuss course concepts or take different sides of an issue and debate their merits. Students can share drafts of papers that they're writing and get feedback from you and other students. Students can work on difficult problem sets, share solutions, and ask for help when they get stuck. Organize students into groups and have them answer questions about a case study. Or they can write and practice a presentation about a topic of your choosing. There are ways of using class time for activities involving any discipline. The important thing is to get students to engage with the content of your course. Flipping your classroom involves some serious thinking about the way you were teaching and the way students learn. So you may want to start with a single topic or week and see how it goes. The results may surprise you. This has been Flipping the Classroom Simply Speaking. To get more information about this topic, visit tlt.its.psu.edu slash flip. This video was produced by Penn State University and is available for use under Creative Commons license. Yay, Penn State. Okay, so that's, in a sense, what a blended course design does, but it doesn't just have to be blended. Um, 
Technology isn't just about cutting down the amount of time you spend in class, although that's, that's a noble goal. That's, that's a noble goal for administrators especially, um, because a lot of blended learning is being pushed by administrators who don't want as much a brick and mortar, because if the students are doing more online, you don't need as much classroom space. It's easier for the registrar to schedule. But that's not why I'm here talking about blended learning. I'm here talking about it because I'm convinced that it improves learning. It does also increase accessibility. And accessibility is critical. So let's, first of all, at least my definition of it, um, and I'm going to use um, Garrison and Vaughn. That's an important adjective. It's not too, I think far too many teachers say, oh, I saw the coolest thing that my kid did. I want to use this technology. Technology requires <laughs> So let's talk about, in, in broad brush strokes, what, what we're looking at in 2012. Th this, in a sense, if we look at the amount of technology on uh, y-axis, you can tell I'm, by the way, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a chemist. Um, but I, I teach a lot of the sciences. And I teach uh, philosophy courses to bioethics and philosophy of science and philosophy of the mind. Um, so on the, the x-axis is time in the classroom. So the maximum amount of time in this teacher-centered model that we've been stuck with since the days of Plato and Aristotle in the Lyceum, and we, we like our face-to-face -face time, and we kind of measure student completion of a degree by number of credits. And we credits by number of hours. Um, and I know we get paid by the number of contact hours each week. A full-time faculty member at Penn State Berks has a 9-9 course load. At Millersville University, where my wife teaches, it's a 12-12 course load. And it's that number of credits, those are the number of hours you're expected to spend with your students. That's OK with web assisted also, because you're not cutting down time in the classroom. But this becomes tricky for unions, <laughs> um, for administrators, for colleagues who say, I want to teach. I want to teach a blended course like Ike does because he doesn't work as hard as I do. Because he's, he's not spending time in the classroom. Look, he's over here. He's reduced time. Lazy. <laughs> Online, right, could almost be at zero. Although one of the most interesting debates, I think, is how important synchronous online learning is. The, the idea of bringing students together in a virtual space with like Adobe Connect and having, not a lecture, although that tends to, oh, lecture time. Um, because the lecture can still be online, like the flipping the classroom that I showed you. We're talking here, at least in sciences, I, I call them clicker questions, but they're polling type questions. For those who use Adobe Connect, there's polling features. And students can put in what answer they think. And then if they get it wrong, they can ask questions either in the chat room or with a microphone. And you have an online discussion. There's kind of this back channel communication in online where I'll mention something and a student will type a question to me. You know, where is that in the book? And one of the other students says, oh, he's on page 169. There's a chart there. That's great. Students now are interacting, but you've, the, the synchronous creates the sense of community in ways that you can't always get when it's completely asynchronous. Um, but community, as you heard in the keynote this morning, is, is critical to changing minds, but it's, it's incredibly challenging really in both these formats because we tend to think that the more time students spend face-to-face, -face, right? We have, we're in a quantity model. The more time they spend, 
the more they'll learn. So we've got to kind of get away from this quantity and start looking at the quality of what they're doing also. And I would argue that I'm spending as much time preparing and helping students learn, and students are spending as much time as they do here. This, the online is a trickier animal. Um, and it's interesting because there are some universities that are taking online and moving them to hybrid, but most of the ones I've seen, you start with face-to-face, -face, kind of go web-assisted, and then move that direction. This is the paradigm that we've had, as I said, since antiquity. Right? If you dropped Plato down in our classrooms today, he'd go, I got this. If you dropped Hippocrates into a modern operating room, he'd be like, what? <laughs> Plato's comfortable, though. We want to make Plato uncomfortable. We would like for him to come in and go, what is going on? Students are in groups. They're, they're talking to each other. What? That's, that's what we want Plato to be doing. So. When we think about learner-centered teaching, there was an editorial in the New York Times a couple of years ago that stuck with me, and I wish I could remember who wrote it. Um, as an academic, I probably should if I'm going to cite it. Um, <laughs> so I remember the idea, which I think is what the writer would have wanted anyway. But um, <laughs> how's that? <clears throat> Whoever wrote it suggested that the best type of learning is one-on-one. -on -one. Think golf pro, think music teacher, think chef. There's two there, I guess. But, um, <laughs> technology, and my, um, my wife's dissertation director was Pat Terenzini, who wrote How College Affects Students. And Pat always said that research requires one compromise after another. See, I remember he said that one. Um, I say teaching requires one compromise after another because this is the ideal teaching environment. Not many of us get that <laughs> because, because there's an issue of scale. College costs are already pretty high. <laughs> one chemistry student at a time. We, we need a few more faculty. <laughs> Technology, though, if done right, allows us to approach this. And that's, that was kind of the point of the Times editorial, that the technology gives us tools so that each learner can spend the time that they feel is necessary. They can go back and watch a video again. They can go back and try a quiz again. Um, if you give, I give multiple attempts at quizzes. So technology helps us approach this, which is, I think we can all agree, that's a pretty good thing if you can give direct feedback right away. So, okay. So we, we like the learn, I like the learner-centered approach is good. By the way, I did cite some of the sources here. Um, Bar and Tag wrote a change article. Mary Ellen Weimer um, wrote a book, and she's currently doing the update. I think it's supposed to come out next year on learner-centered teaching. Um, I did some reading of your strategic plan. <laughs> Look at these pictures. Oh, I have faculty pictures coming up. So if you're here, I apologize. <clears throat> So, you want to inspire lives. In order to inspire, I think learning has to be on the learner-centered side. It's not, right? There are the, the exceptional teachers who lead by example, who are just the greatest human beings in the world, and they want their students to be exactly like them. I'm not one of those people. I want my students to kind of find their own inspiration. And I'd like them to do it because of the learning environment that I've created for them, not because they want to be just like me. Um, when I first started, I'll tell you a quick story. When I first started 
coordinating the science degree. And I looked at measures of success. You start reading the literature about what, what four-year degree programs want their students to be able to do. Oh, my. so many programs were the proudest when their students went to graduate school. And I thought, well, yeah, because they're going to be just like the teacher. Why can't we praise students who are finding success in jobs, who are finding success in professional schools, as a pharmacist, or as a chiropractor, or as a pediatrician? That, to me, is equally beneficial, not just, oh, we had this many students going to get PhDs. Anyway, inspiration, I think, has to come from the student, but I'm convinced that you guys can help create the environment to help students find that inspiration. So, outstanding and relevant learning experiences, valued credentials, and lifelong student success. I might, I might take the valued credentials because we, the degree is important, but the value added is much more important. What you help the student to learn, I think is more important than the degree itself. There's a book out right now called Losing Our Minds that I read on the plane. I had a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still awake. <laughs> 37 hours later. Um, no, I feel like a college student. <laughs> Um, anyway, the authors argue that credentials aren't critical. What's, what's critical is that the students do more of the life-changing learning. So getting a bachelor's is how we certify that they've accomplished something. The problem that the authors are arguing is that we're not sure what we're certifying. Now, I hope you guys know. I hope you're doing assessment. I hope you're learning objectives. Anyway, um, okay, and there and, and and value values are tough to instill just by lecturing. These are your values, by the way, everyone in here. We all learn, we all serve, we all lead. End of discussion. There are your values. it takes a little more than that okay good um, so again you, when you look at your strategies you want life-changing learning Mind you, we all lead, we all learn. We all, oh, I already forgot. We all serve. Thanks. Okay, now I don't have to go back. So you've learned. Good job. Um, this is a little harder to measure. Just, and this was, I didn't, I didn't pick these to, to, um, make a political statement in any way. I, I wanted to help demonstrate why you're here. But yeah, a flawless execution. <laughs> and you're, I think you're talking about the, the delivery, not the. I'm done. <laughs> this 
this is this is gonna be the pinnacle. Wow. Um. Okay. So I I've, I've taught. 16 years, I told the earlier group, I, I teach about 10 courses a year. So um, in a variety, I teach all the different formats, um, four courses a semester, and then usually two over the summer. Um, and I've won, whilst modesty aside, I've won uh, almost every teaching award Penn State can, has presented. And I don't think, I don't think I've ever taught. I've had, I've had like 15 or 20 minutes of flawless execution. <laughs> but this, this does, I, the, the intent, I think, is utilize assessment. So on a, on a more serious note, we, we do want to make sure that what we're trying to help students learn is what they're learning. And we want to make sure our assessment measures assess that. I can tell you that my advisees, that the teachers that they get most frustrated with are the ones who teach one thing and seem to test something else. And I, have co I had colleagues when I was in the Navy, they'd say, oh, I, you teach to the test. That's what the Navy has decided is the most important things for these students to know before they operate a nuclear submarine. <laughs> I'm okay teaching to the test. <laughs> there are still students out there. I taught in the military from 87 to 91, so probably they're just starting to retire, but I I've probably still have officers out there who I helped train who have kept the Navy without a nuclear accident. So, I'll take some credit. Um, okay. One of my favorite, I'm always reading, sorry, I um, don't mean to get pedantic here, but, um, oh, and I'm moving, all right. Um, so, this is a really awesome book, How Learning Works. Let's go through these just briefly so that you understand that if, if you did nothing else as you're designing courses for the next time you teach, if you kept these seven principles in mind, right, seven's a nice number, it's the, our working memory right between five and nine, that's why phone digits are seven numbers, and anyway, um, so, uh, Covey's seven habits of highly effective people, seven's a lucky number. Okay, so seven principles. Um, Students do not come to you with a blank slate. I know you like to think so. Ah, oh, students don't know anything about chemistry, so we'll start back at the beginning. <laughs> they, they have a variety of ideas. Some are wrong. <laughs> Some get in the way. One of my favorite studies about in, in the physics world is that if you test students on what's called a forced concept inventory before a course, which are things like why do we have seasons, and does your weight change as you go up and down in an elevator, what happens when you swing, swing a ball and let it go. You ask students those type of conceptual questions, and then you look at the end of the course and you give the same test. And there's very little improvement, even for the A students. And so, the researchers went and looked at some of this, and then they talked to the students. And this is the kind of things that A students would say. Well, I know that in class, we always viewed everything as frictionless. So that's why when you let the ball go, yeah, ideally it goes on a tangent. But not when I let it go, it goes straight out. Like, no! <laughs> no, that's not right! But that's, it's like, oh, I knew what to put for the test. But that doesn't change my baseline. And so students have concepts that are deeply embedded. And a lot of them are wrong. And a lot of them get in the way of their learning. So you've got to at least try to figure out what they know and what misconceptions they might have. Student organization. We know that 
the, the human brain, right? Seven, seven pieces of information. Um, there's great books out on memory right now. Um, one of them is called uh, Moonwalking with Einstein about um, jo Jonathan Fuller. See, I'm remembering some names now. Um, wrote about being in the US memory championships. And what we know is that if you compress information, like if I give you seven numbers to memorize, 747-1492, that's a lot easier to remember if you think big plain Columbus. You now have those two numbers, and instead of seven bits of information, you've chunked them into two. Big plain Columbus. The numbers, by the way, were 747. <laughs> 1492, okay. Just so we're, <laughs> I don't know, I, I don't want to embarrass. People are like, I wasn't listening. What the hell did he just say? <laughs> you may not believe the third one, but I think what you do, if, if you believe in your strategic plan about inspiration, then you've got to find ways to help students want to learn. And there's better ways than saying, learn, damn it, or I'll fail you. <laughs> that's, that's one way of motivating. It is, but I think there are others. So be creative in that. Um, whoops. There's another really cool study about chess masters, and this has to do with organizational also. If you give um, two groups of people, chess masters and non-chess players, chess boards to memorize. You would think that the grandmasters would do well. And they do, they do better as long as the board represents some type of possible moves in a game. If the pieces are random, both groups do about the same because they're both just or they're just trying, they, they have no way to chunk it. So you want to get students to a point where they see your course as the forest, so that when you get new trees, they know kind of where in the forest that goes. So mastery is critical. One of the ways to get to mastery is this feedback, and that's kind of the, the blended learning piece. <coughs> Course climate, this ties in a little with number three with motivation, but you need some theory. I, I know that some teachers are like, oh, theory, we're, you know, um, attribution theory, how, what students attribute their success to if students think that, oh, well, I'm just bad at math. That, then they will be bad at math. So you've got to help understand that if a student tells you that, there's more going on in that student's brain than just problems with the math. They, they have a deep-seated attribution that they're not going to do well in math, and no matter how hard they work. So understanding student development, in some ways, you're treating each student as an individual. And I think we can all agree that's critical also because of what number one was, that right each student brings their own ideas. So you've got to understand the individual um, aspect that some students bring. And then finally, um, I think we want students to be self-directed learners. I'm convinced that technology gives us that potential. OK, so that's kind of how learning works. Here's one more set of five. Um, I'm going to go really quickly through these. You need to share power with your students. You need to not make it all about, I'm a teacher, you're the learner. Enough said. Do what I said. You want to share. You want students to have some control. And technology allows them to do that, right? They can go back and watch the video again and again. They can decide to skip it if they think they know that. Anyway. Um, the content isn't an end in and of itself. Yes, content is important. No one teaches a course without content. But content can do so much more. You can help students learn to write about your subject. You can help them learn to negotiate in a team about your subject. You can help them give presentations, develop oral communication skills about your subject. That's all content being used 
to accomplish other skills as well. So don't just view content as the end in and of itself. By the way, Mary Ellen did not write this book about technology. <laughs> but technology helps share power. Technology gets the content away from the face-to-face -face so that students can spend as much time with the content as they want so that they can use it for whatever purposes help them achieve mastery. The teacher becomes a designer of learning experiences. Responsibility for learning now sits squarely on the student's shoulder in a blended and an online course in ways that I would argue face-to-face -face, it's too easy for us as teachers. Right? We tell students to read the book ahead of time, and the students come in and ask them some questions. No one answers. It's really easy for the teacher to say, oh, I'll tell you what you should have gotten out of the reading, and guess what's going to happen the next time you tell the students to read? They're pretty savvy about this stuff. They're, they're good at maximizing their investment of time. If you're going to tell them what's important, they're not going to read the book. OK. And then evaluation. We tend, in higher education, to grade our students the way we do cuts of meat. Prime choice. Really? Come on. Evaluation is why I said this in the last session. Students don't differentiate between a five-point assignment and a 500-point assignment. They see point. That's, that's what they focus Ooh, points. <laughs> you can use points to get them to do a lot of different things. Take advantage of that. OK. So in a blended course and an online course, and I would argue in a web-enhanced course, I'm going to let you just read these. I think you know where they're going. Where do most faculty spend their time thinking about? <laughs> I'm encouraging you to start thinking a lot more seriously about the other two times. So seriously that you might find out that you don't need as much time here. Not everyone likes cutting class time. And that's, you know, then it's a web enhanced. But I think sometimes when you signal to students that what they're doing is so important here and here, that you don't have to meet on Friday. And they're going to do work, either quizzes, wikis, discussion boards, voice thread. They're going to do something that and they have to be responsible for it. You have to have like an online quiz. You have to have a Dropbox of some sort, maybe a small writing assignment. Yes, it, some of it may be more work for you, although in the sciences, i got to tell you, online quizzes, multiple choice, I give all short answer. I, I teach 60 to 70 students in each of my classes. So just so we're clear, I don't give any scantrons. I give all short answer. But for online open book quizzes, I don't mind multiple choice. And it grades itself. <laughs> it's like I'm in my great book and there's grains peppered. It's like, woo! <laughs> and it doesn't do anything. So here's a little theory. Sorry, I know you know Bloom, but ideally, this is how it would break down. Now, these distinctions aren't that clear, but. Too many classes use the during class, the whole thing shifts down, and the before class gets lost completely. <coughs> the after class, sometimes they'll have to apply or analyze. And very rarely, and I'm not saying this from just anecdotal evidence, we know, for at least in the sciences, um, they're the learning goals, the exam questions, when you analyze, like introductory biology courses, oh, whoa, you are down here. Even if the teacher says, oh, critical thinking is so important, well, that's not what you're testing on. 
So move some of this before the students ever say no. Oh! <laughs> done and done. <laughs> Wait, what am I supposed to say? Damn, David. Because <laughs> right, because he was he was mad because his technology wasn't working so well. All right, all right. Um, huh? That was cool. Is it gonna do it again? No. I don't know what. I, maybe I double click. Anyway, all right. So. Flip the class, that was the opening video that I showed you. I'll let you look at that. Motivation. These are some of the ways to do it. I'm not gonna go through each of these. Um, there's, there's class guides, there's, I, I mentioned a lot of these already, so. But you have to be consistent with these. The students are gonna whine. I don't, I don't know how to do that. Okay, well you still need to submit the assignment. But you didn't teach me. We're gonna do some of it in class, but I want you to think about it. But I don't know how to do it. Okay, fine, I'll show you how to. As soon as you do that, as soon as you give in, you're, you're back to lecture format, you're back to face to face. Someone asked me in the last session, how, how do you respond when students want to go back to the, the comfortable paradigm that they know? Could you just please tell me what I need to know for the test? I, I want to take some notes. I, I don't make me click on anything. Um, don't make me get in a small group because my classmates are idiots. Just tell me what I need. It's too easy to give in to that. We know that that's not going to help. Uh, some students may, may benefit from that because they're deeply committed to that paradigm. But the more you teach this way in a blended format, the more you flip, the better off you're going to be. So um, by the way, so I'm not going to have time to show you maybe I Wait. Da, 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 da. Oh, now I'm not there. All right, we're not going to do it. Um, I have a, um, I have, whoops, let's go back to this. Got to keep the PowerPoints going. Oh, I don't know how to teach without them. <laughs> I had no idea what I was going to say. Clear instruction. <laughs> Um, the, the students in this nutrition class have to analyze their diet for three days. And I was having the damnedest time typing out all the instructions because students would go on the USDA website and be like, I don't understand where I'm supposed to find the food and how do I decide if it's a large or a medium banana? It's like, oh my god. <laughs> So I recorded Camtasia. I have heard that um, is a software that <clears throat> some of you are using. It's a really cool software. Um, it allows you to capture the screen. And so what I did is I went to the USDA website, and I walked students through what they should do. And it took about seven minutes. Well, it took me longer because I kept screwing up. But it's a seven-minute clip that I, well, I used it for the first time last semester. I had no question about this assignment. I'm like, oh, oh, <laughs> 15 minutes of flawless execution. <laughs> so that was, the rest of the course sucked. But, <clears throat> read that last statement and try to convince yourself that it's true. One of my favorite uh, pieces about this is Mike Rose's book. Um, Uh-oh, I just blanked. Anyway, he, he started by quoting um, 
faculty would say, our, I don't know who we're letting in anymore. Our students are not as capable as they used to be. This is a, an embarrassment for our institution. And it was Harvard 1896. It's like, OK. So, <laughs> It was old, so students were dumb, and apparently in 1850 they were really good. And then in 1896, it was like, and Harvard, Schmarvard. So your students are highly capable people. They are. They might not always seem that way, and they might test you to get you to revert back to that old paradigm. Don't let them, because you are the teacher, and you know what's better for them, because you know about the seven principles now that help with learning. You know about blended design. You can help students become fully developed learners. You can. So in class, you need to think about all this active learning. It's so much fun. And there are all kinds of cool pictures. By the way, these are all from your website. I don't know if you're noticing that. All right. Read this. <laughs> Lives in the Balance, by the way, was the Mike Rose book I was trying to think about. Um, anyway, yeah. 1700. Silly lectures. We got books. Well, now we don't need books. We got the web. Right? I can show you a little bit. And don't, I'm not demeaning books. Books are still important. But your students can learn from other areas, too. The, the Camtasia that you create, the YouTube videos, podcasts, they're all important. So these are just some things that you could think about. And they were exemplified in the little video that I showed you. These. This is actually from our school, because that's one of our peer mentors. That's a clicker question. And this is students, well, they should be sitting in a group. <laughs> Some students. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, after class, if you're thinking Bloom's taxonomy now, oh, I got loud because, whew. All right. Um, there, there's all kinds of activities. I'm not trying to give you specifics. What I'm trying to get you to do is when you leave here, I don't want you to think, well, I already do after class stuff. I tell my students to try some problems. It's probably not enough. You kind of need to make it a climate, right? If it's cold outside, the student puts their coat on. You want to make it so that when they leave, they know that they've got to do the quiz over the weekend. And they will spend time on task because there's some points. They won't even know that they're learning. They just know that they've got to get it done because they need points. <laughs> so find ways to make them accountable. So these are, these are the constituents. And I know I'm getting close here. So. Um, <laughs> Kennison, you, students, let's talk about it. Okay. I know this is one for administration, but I'm now, I, I thinking, I'm always thinking of new course design. So I just taught a neurobiology course this semester for the first time, and I've already taught a philosophy of the mind course. And I realized that what I want to do is I want to teach them as a learning community. And I thought, oh my god, blended design. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, for an hour, two courses, just kind of put in a blender. So, like, right? So th there's kind of seamless. I'm going to have to figure out ways of teasing apart the grades, and, but it's still blending in my mind. But, um, but look, the reason I can do that is because I'm like, oh my gosh, so much flexibility. Now, I don't know how much your administration trusts you. But um, <laughs> but you, you can really create courses that you think are going to best facilitate learning. Um, when you, it comes to providing assessment, whether it's um, scholarship of teaching and learning or pedagogical research, if you want to publish about this, if it's um, 
supporting learning goals that you have for accrediting agencies, that you can get a lot from blended courses because you have all that stuff online. You have student grades, you have how much time they spent on the web. You can't always be sure that they're spending time doing what, right? When D2L is open, they could also have other websites open. <laughs> but but there, there are ways of getting some assessment results. Um, I think if done right, it improves efficiency. And this is going to be a theme. OK. Um, so for you, your students are going to be more engaged. They will actually like coming to class more. Because, because the stuff they're doing in class isn't. <laughs> they're now doing stuff. They get more flexibility too, which is great. So I'm teaching a blended course um, on, oh, what the hell am I teaching in the fall? Oh, cell signaling. So it's a primary literature course. I only wanted two days a week because I wanted them to do a lot more online. I'm like, oh, it's, all the other instructors had taken the morning classes. So all that was left was two the 2.30 time slot. No one wants to come to class 2.30 on a Friday afternoon. My attendance is always piss poor. I'm like, oh, that's the day that they're going to blend. So I have a Monday, Wednesday on the registrar's thing. It says Monday, Wednesday, and web. Oh, I'm like, where to go? I, I know, I have a sore, sore, sore shoulder from doing that a lot. Um, anyway, you're going to like your course again. Because you're going to think about it in different ways. Oh, and guess what? Students, oh, engagement, engagement, and, oh, oh. immediate <laughs> feedback, greater accessibility, oh, I know you don't think students care about learning, they just care about the grade, but they do. We know that the dopamine reward system, I don't know you guys very well, but the dopamine reward system also is active in sexual arousal. <laughs> and so learning has some of those same pleasure pathways. We've just, we've killed it. <laughs> All right, so I want to leave some time for questions. So let me give you 10 quick tips about technology. Here we go. All right. No more than necessary. Don't put everything but the kitchen sink in there. Less is often more. Uh, some of you may take me to task on this, but I'm telling you, if you just create a quiz bank where the students can take it over and over again, um, and you still have um, large-scale assessment, like, like in-class high-stakes grading, so you still have a test that you proctor, I don't think you have to worry as much as you think. Um, the students who cheat, are not going to do well on those tests anyway. And, and I would say they're hurting themselves. I think it comes out especially in the way you set up the point system. So make the quizzes worth small amounts of points. Let them take it a lot of times. Students will figure out that there's really no benefit to cheating. But anyway, I don't think you should agonize as much as a lot of people seem to. We forget. We, we're very visually oriented. Do a podcast. Do Camtasia. Talk over those images. Don't just put PowerPoints up. Um, and we're text-based. Oh my god, when you see PowerPoint, I know this is not a good example of that because I'm putting a lot of text on it. <laughs> that aside, we put a lot of text. We, it's hard as faculty to believe that a video, right, a YouTube video could actually facilitate learning because we think that text Based sources. Even when you look at, like when faculty put, start putting textbooks online, oh, it's just all text with a few hyperlinks. It's like, oh, now it's online. And, and we, put, we put a picture maybe amidst 500 words and think, oh, that's better than the book. Anyway, try audio. Inside and outside of class. I will tell you that um, collaboration is the hardest thing for me to figure out online, especially in organic chemistry and general chemistry. But um, in a lot of disciplines, that's critically important. So find ways to do it, both in class and out. Try to change your philosophy. Just you don't have to. You don't have to love technology. 
but try not to hate it. <laughs> Life is frittered away by detail, and we do try, when we get new technology, when we try to create things on our course, we make them too complicated. Students will get lost. Yes, keep it simple, sweetie. I know it's not sweetie. There's a, oh my god, in my neurobiology book, we were talking about the um, sympathetic versus the parasympathetic, and the textbook authors said, the way to remember the sympathetic is the four Fs. Fight, fright, flight, and sex. <laughs> <laughs> My students like that. <laughs> points. Put a small number of points. Get students doing things on tasks. We know that students who spend time on tasks do better in the course. This goes back to the learning thing that your students are individuals. Try to get to know them. They're really remarkable people. They are. Um, you, you will find that what you do face to face, if you utilize technology importantly, uh, it, it, a revolution isn't too strong a word. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm convinced that we are, we are experiencing one of the biggest shifts in higher education ever, ever. Um, but it's not the technology, it's what you're doing with it. Okay, all right. So, remember the types of courses, but remember more than anything, this is where you're going. Thanks. Uh, I left a few minutes. What do, you, what do you want to ask me? Other than, can we have the drawing? <laughs> for the test. Oh! Oh, crap, I didn't do that. Oh, I'll, see me after class. I'll, I'll go through it with you. 